So I'm, I'm going to dim the light a little. It's not meant to put you to sleep. So if you feel like you're getting really tired, let me know. I can increase a little bit, but I think the contrast is a little bit better. <clears throat> so it's nice to see you all back today. You look very refreshed, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> so a, a few quick announcements. So we have this uh, temporary workshop page. I think Jacob announced it yesterday where we put the slides. So again, the slides that we'll use today, we'll put on there. And we'll also add some uh, book chapter that sort of covers the theory of M-cell um, that goes into much more detail than I will in my presentation today. And we'll make this into a nicer web page and hopefully add some of the lectures that we are filming here. Um, We'll put announce it on the front page of mcell.org, so once it's nicer and up and running. But for the time being, that's sort of our repository of material, so we'll keep adding to that. Um, so uh, what we'll do this morning is two things. I'm going to give you a, it's a fairly brief introduction into a little bit more of the, the theory behind mcell and the methods that we use um, in, in the M-cell code. So it's about an hour's worth of material. I'm not going to, so I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to go into the, into the very deep details. I'm not going to derive everything. Um, but hopefully it's going to be enough to just show you that you know, there's, it's all well-founded in, in sort of mathematical theory and all well-defined. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna, we're going to post a book chapter on this website that I showed you that really goes into everything into much more depth than I will do here. So if you want to really go through the derivations and do all the math, um, look at that book chapter and you find everything there. Science. Right, and the science paper. So I'm not going to go through all the derivations. Hopefully, I'll take small enough steps so that you can follow. But if you're not that mathematically inclined, it's not a problem. So it's not, it's not crucial for using MSO, but I think it's nice to just see what's going on under the hood. So, you know, if, if you're a little bit confused, don't worry. Take a look at that book chapter if you want, or just absorb it um, as is. And then uh, we'll have a small break. And then Jim Fader, who is preparing in the back, <laughs> will tell us about... Uh, I'm trying to get the link for it to... Right. Will tell us about Bionet Gen and how to use his software. And but also, in, and then in the afternoon, we'll, um, you can either continue on the M-cell tutorials on your own projects. And Jim will also have some uh, Bionagen stuff happening, right? In the afternoon. In the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, do a little, we'll do a short demo. OK. And then people can work right. on their own on that or right. whatever they want. Exactly. Yeah. And as usual, I already talked to a few people. I'm I, Tom. Jacob, be around all day. So if you have questions about your projects or just want to um, chat a little bit, just grab any of us and we'd be happy to talk. OK, so um, let's start with this overview of M-cell methods. And just a quick reminder, we went, o we, we went over this yesterday. Basically, we want to um, simulate these uh, realistic um, 3D microphysiological systems at length scales from na nanometers and up and time scales of nanoseconds and longer. And here's two examples we saw yesterday. This is the neuropill and this is our frog active zone model. Um, and just sort of a quick reminder, so that, that again harks back at these different levels that I talked about, you know, from the atomistic to the cell to the tissue. If, if you look at the atomistic level, if you look inside a cell, and this is a real simplification that I'm doing here now, it's, 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 if you look at a cell, it's mostly water at first approximation. There's a lot of water molecules in cells um, that solvate um, biomolecules, proteins, whatever you, whatever you have. Right? And so if you actually look at a cell, um, it may look like that. If you, if you look at it in Van der Waals representation, you basically see water molecules there's actually a protein inside here that you can see. You can see a little bit. There's something blue here. It's a nitrogen atom of an ubiquitin molecule, but you can't see it. It's sort of hidden 
within the water molecules. And the length scale, if you look, if you look at, this, at this type of system, if you do MD simulations, you're dealing with very short time scales. You're dealing with femtoseconds. Um, and the time scale here is really imposed by the frequency of your bond vibrations. And one of the, some of the fastest bond vibrations is typically a carbon-hydrogen bond, which um, vibrates on the order of 10 femtoseconds. And so to sample that, you have to, you have to, you ha your time step has to be smaller than that. Otherwise, you can't sample it. So femtosecond is typically imposed by the, just the stuff that's going on in your system. And the typical length scales are angstroms, which are typical bond lengths. And, and, and in fact, this restriction here for MD simulations to have to use femtosecond makes them very difficult to extend to long time scales. Because if, even if you uh, want to go to just um, nanoseconds, you have to do a million iterations. If you want to go to microseconds, you have to do a billion iterations, and if you want to go to milliseconds, and you can do the math. So it's very expensive to go far in time scale. Um, so one other fact is that uh, at, at room temperatures, if you do the StatMac, molecules move fairly rapidly. So you can, you can do the math if you just use equilibrium statistical mechanics. So these molecules are actually fairly rapidly moving. Um, and so what, what happens um, is that you have frequent collisions of water molecules with biomolecules. And if you, if you just um, ignore the water molecules and you just focus on, the, on, on your biomolecules that you're interested in themselves, you see them sort of moving randomly. Um, and this is basically the water molecules just bumping into them and just you know, moving them around in random directions. And so, what, so we kind of um, built on that using our M-cell simulations in that um, at the length scales and time scales we are interested in, so order of microseconds perhaps, and the length scales order of microns, we basically, we'll basically say, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to do something to make these possible. We can't do MD simulations. So we'll have to, we have to do some approximations. And, um, that's something you, all, you typically always have to do if you run computer simulations. You have to do, you have to make some approximation. You have to be aware of what that approximation is, um, um, and then just make sure that the approximation is, is, is adequate for the problem you want to solve. And the approximation we, we do here is basically we ignore all the water molecules, the solvents, and we characterize this rapid motion um, that, that motion of the biomolecules we're interested in that you would also observe in an MD simulation um, by a diffusion coefficient. So basically our diffusion coefficient embodies all those interactions that you, that you could observe microscopically but that we just don't want to deal with and can't deal with in order to make progress both in terms of going to larger length scales and to longer time scales. Um, and so it is an approximation in the sense that you basically um, that you basically cannot describe um, things easily, properties that molecules have, like there's no electrostatics. Um, in our simplest M cell approximation, they don't have a size. They're just characterized by the way they move around and by the way they react with other molecules. Um, all of these things can be remedied to some degree. You can, you can make them space filling, but that, that adds a cost. Um, and so you know, when you, when you wanted to run your simulations, then you just have to balance how much can you afford computational um, expense. Um, on the other hand, you have what you, want, what you want to simulate, and so you have to strike a balance. And perhaps there are some problems out there where there is no good balance right now. And, and, and you may, there may not be a good tool right now to really simulate what you want. But, um, Okay, and so basically what we do here is we use Monte Carlo methods to simulate um, our system using reaction diffusion um, approaches. A, a second method you could in principle employ here, and we talked about this yesterday already, are finite element methods um, used in fluid dynamics or other approaches. And these are in principle also quite applicable for these types of systems. Um, depending a little bit on how your system looks like. So if, if you really, 
if you have a simple system that's just a cube or a sphere or an ellipsoid, then finite element might, might be adequate and appropriate. And if you have a well-mixed system, many molecules. Um, however, for many of the systems we're interested in, we don't necessarily have a well-mixed system. We have very small systems that are very confined, small numbers of molecules. And for these types of systems, Monte Carlo methods, reaction diffusion methods, particle-based reaction diffusion methods using Monte Carlo methods are um, quite appropriate and much more, can be much more powerful and actually easier to use than finite element methods. But it, it depends, again, a little bit on the system. Um, and they have the, ab the additional advantage, of course, that you, um, in addition to an, the average behavior of your system, you also get information about um, the noise in your system that can be a very important quantity for you to look at. Something you don't get using PDEs, for example. Um, so let's t first talk sort of about the diffusion part, the way particles move around in, um, in your system, and the way we do this in M cell. And basically, the underlying theory is diffusion theory um, that was established um, in the uh, in about 1855, um, sort of a guy named a Adolf Fick, I think it was German if I'm not mistaken, um, established these two laws, his first law and his second law. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, J here is basically a diffusion flux. C is the concentration. So what his first law says uh, and so this operator here is, is the gradient operator, for those of you who don't know what this is. So basically what this, what Fick's first law says is that um, if you have a spatial change in concentration, this causes an associated flux, um, diffusion flux. And the, the, and, and the constant of proportionality between these two quantities is the diffusion coefficient. And that's, an, that's a minus sign. Um, because um, basically, if you have um, if you have a decrease in concentration, then you have a flux into into that direction, right? If you have less, then you have a flux into. If you have more, then you have a flux out of. And so this is why the, there is a minus sign. And D is basically the, pro the the constant of proportionality for this relation. I hope that makes sense. It's it's sort of. If you think about it, that's probably what you write down. It's, it's sort of a very simple restatement of something you would, you would expect to happen. If, if you have less concentration somewhere in space, you get an influx of stuff into that space. And so this is basically what this equation says. And then if you, use, if you take this first law and you basically impose a, a conservation of particles that you say you can't destroy stuff. So if basically the rate of change of concentration has to be balanced by, by um, a spatial change of the flux. Basically, your particles can't just magically disappear or reappear. Um, and if you impose this, you end up right away with this equation here, which is the diffusion equation, which basically says that the rate of change of constant, that the change in time, the time dependence of the concentration is proportional to the gradient of this, this quantity, and if the, your diffusion coefficient is, um, doesn't change as a function of, of location, you can actually pull out this guy, and you basically have the second derivative of the concentration, and the constant of proportionality is the diffusion constant. Um, if you would, this, this equation is also known as the heat equation, so if you have heat transfer, um, you'd get the same equation. It's a very fundamental equation. In our case, we call it the diffusion equation, but it's sort of a stereotypical equation. It could also transfer heat or other things. And this same equation also appears uh, various places in quantum mechanics. Right. Right. Everywhere. If you're a mathematical person, it's just a type of differential equation that applies to many problems. Um, OK, so, th so basically, the diffusion equation is our starting point. That's well, de well defined mathematically. Again, J is the diffusion flux. Here's some of the units. D is the fusion coefficient. C is the concentration. And so basically, so this is once more the diffusion equation. Um, 
In our case, what we, what we have in our systems is that they're radially symmetric, so there's no preferred direction. Um, and so if we do this, basically our concentration becomes a function not of the vector r, but of this r, the radial distance. And so you can simplify this, this diffusion equation into this. And um, for certain um, boundary conditions, you can actually solve it analytically. So if you have a point source of particles, um, <coughs> so point source of m molecules, you can solve this equation, and this is the solution. And, and hopefully, all of you have seen something like that. It's a very famous relationship and sort of this is the key point, it's a Gaussian, right? So basically your solution is a Gaussian function, in this case centered around the origin because our point source is on the origin. And this lambda here is a function of time, so you can see as time progresses this Gaussian will initially be a delta function and then so, sort of spread out from the origin, so particles will spread out from their source. So this is basically what this equation says, and so this is just... That's the solution in three dimensions. Three dimensions, right. So a three-dimensional, so basically it, you have to imagine this um, spherical shell sort of s starting at a point and then just spreading out. So this is the solution to the diffusion equation. Okay? So you even, so hopefully every, all of you have seen this, so this is, I think, a crucial ingredient that you have this Gaussian shape of this, of this solution um, to the diffusion equation. And so, so how do we util, utilize this in, in our M-cell simulations? Basically, since we do stochastic reaction uh, uh, diffusion, we convert this, this uh, concentration um, profile um, that, that we have derived here into a pro probability of particles um, moving a distance between r and r plus delta r. So this is basically just rewriting of this solution, solution here. And since it's a three-dimensional problem, you basically have to integrate over the whole, over sort of a spherical shell of thickness 4 pi r squared. So this is basically a spherical shell at distance r um, in three dimensions. So basically the probability, um, in the probability of a particle that is original at the origin, moving a distance r away is given by this equation, right? And it's time dependent. It changes as a function of it changes as a function of time. So it, it has this Gaussian shape. So there's if if you if you look at a given particle at a at a given time, it's let's just say it's at the origin, and you want to know where it, where is it going to be after time t, then this then this equation basically tells you the probability distribution where this particle will be in space at time t. And this is basically what we use in M cell. I'll talk a bit more about this. We have a radially symmetric system, so the, the direction where we go is random. There's no, we just pick a random direction, and this tells us how far we should go. And you can see that um, this lambda actually depends on the time and on the diffusion coefficient, right? So basically, particles that have a larger diffusion coefficient take, on average, larger steps. And if you increase your time step, you'll also take, on average, larger steps. So basically, um, the step length is determined by how fast the particle diffuses and how large your time step is. So, you can, so this basically comes back to what I said yesterday, that by adjusting your time step, you adjust, of course, how far particles diffuse on average. So if you need to sample something more, more discreetly and you know, have a small space in your system that you want to sample very finely, basically by adjusting the time step, you can, you're adjusting the probability, uh, the probability distribution, how far your particles will go on average, so you can basically scale it that way. And so you, you can, and this is just sort of a formal thing, you can write this in, in unitless, unitless fashion, introducing this factor s, so that's not th th that important. Um, you can compute two quantities, I just wrote those down here. Basically, uh, this LR bar is the average radial displacement that a pa particle um, does every time step. 
So the average radial displacement is two, 2 over pi times this factor lambda. And the crucial bit here is that lambda, as we saw, I should have repeated it here, is the square root of 4 dt. So the average radial displacement is proportional to the square root of t. And again, sort of that's again a crucial bit that everybody should kind of understand that diffusion is propor proportional to the square root of t. Right? So basically, um, if you increase your time step by a factor of two, you only go as, on average, you only increase your diffusion by a factor of square root of two. So diffusion is, is good at short length scales. It's very difficult to, as, as, as it's difficult to go far distances. So that's why bacteria can rely on diffusion. We wouldn't, in our bodies, we wouldn't want to rely on diffusion for our nutrients to go from well, the gut. Exactly. But that's one thing to keep in mind. So basically, if you want to, if you want to make your diffusion more effective, you want to, if you want to diffuse twice as fast, you need to increase your time by a factor of four. So it's, I think there's a typo. It's possible. It could be, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. I'll check. Yeah, I'll fix it before we post it. Um, too many pies. And so, so basically, this is sort of a summary slide of what happens in M cell. We have this probability distribution. And you can see it's specific for each molecule because it depends on the diffusion coefficient. So each molecule has its own um, probability for radial displacement. And so basically what we do in M cell is embodied in this equation here. You basically look at the cumulative density function. You integrate this um, probability distribution um, over this um, this uh, length scale s. And this is you can actually do this analytically, and this x is a random number um, between zero and one. This is an expression between zero and one. So what we do is we um, we pick a random number um, in M cell and then read off the corresponding um, step length that a particle should take. So this is. This is this com cumulative distribution function of this probability distribution. Um, it goes between um, 0 and 1. So basically, we pick a random number. Say we pick 0 0.08. We go over here, and we read off the, d the displacement that the particle should have. And this is the d displacement we'll pick. So th this, this is basically how we do diffusion in M cell. And the way we used to do it, we used to have a lookup table where we sort of um, pre-computed all these values at startup of M cell to speed up the simulation, but we have, in the meantime, realized that computers are so fast that it's actually mu it's actually faster to compute it during runtime and, and get rid of the lookup table. So it, things have changed between yeah. the old days and the new days. So, um, it's really the trade-off between um, how fast the processor is at computing versus how fast you can look something up. In yes. Memory. So does so if memory were way faster it's today, um, it still it still would be an advantage to have the, the lookup table. So does this make sort of sense? Uh, the mathematical details don't matter. What's important is we have a probability distribution for each molecule that's determined by its diffusion coefficient and the time step that you have selected in your M cell simulation. And then it's just a matter of sampling this distribution. Um, and picking um, from that distribution a, court, a, a, a time step that to go um, to move during the current iteration. That's all we do here. It's basically an efficient sampling of this distribution. Yes. I didn't understand. Like you, you select a random number. And you don't select a random number. Emcel does it for you. Okay, Emcel has a random number generator. Basically, Emcel has the task. This That's is. What I meant. 
fiber M cells. Right, so basically you have this distribution, and now the task for M cell is I have to sample this distribution um, uniformly, right? And so basically the way, so I, so I pick, so I pick um, displacements according to this distribution. I should pick more displacements that are you know, near this peak, obviously, because it's peaked around this value. I should, I should pick this sort of, a, so this is the Gaussian distribution. I should pick displacements out in the tails very, that shouldn't happen very often. I should pick mostly um, displacements around the peak of the Gaussian and very little around the tail. So basically, if you do the cumulative distribution function of this distribution, that maps on this, on this um, probability from 0 to 1. And if you can convince yourself, if you now pick uniformly from the interval between 0 and 1, you'll actually sample this Gaussian distribution properly. Right? But the Dickinson coefficient is constant. That's so right. You're constantly you're playing with your time intervals. Then. No. Well. You, basically, the distribution is fixed. What, what you have to do is, the di distribution is fixed at startup, basically. It's you determine it. It's your diffusion coefficient and the time step. But what's not fixed is the actual displacement. It's a distribution, so you have to sample from Oops, sorry. So basically, what is fixed is the centroid of your Gaussian. That's fixed. But what's not fixed is what you pick from this distribution. So the key is it's a distribution. So it's, it's basically a bag of, of displacements, and you have to pick from this bag um, the, the displacements that actually satisfy this distribution. So in a single time step of length t, mm -hmm. some particles move very short distances, and some mm -hmm. particles move very mm -hmm. long distances. Still the length delta t. Right. For all those particles. Basically, if you have 100 identical particles, they will all move with different um, displacements during a single time step. Most of these particles will have displacements around this peak. There will be a few that move a little bit further, a few that move a little bit less. And there might be one that really moves very far, but it's, it's not that likely. Okay, I, right? yeah. I got confused with the particle displacement and displacement with respect to the starting point. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So, so basically, you could imagine. Right. You could imagine if you have a million particles and you, com and you all compute the dis displacements and you draw a histogram of these displacements, you'd basically reproduce the Gaussian distribution yeah. if you do it correctly. Right. So basically, that's, that's how diffusion happens in the volume in M cell. You pick from this distribution that gives you the displacement, um, and the direction is random. There's no preferred direction. It's isotropic. So the direction you just pick. Um, and there, there's some. Uh, there's, some, there's lots of technical issues to do that correctly. Um, uh, you have to be very careful that you're really isotropic. Um, even there's, there's the numerical issues in, in computational codes if you're not careful. So for these um, stochastic simulations, you have to be very careful not to bias them. Um, you often do many iterations. If you only have a small bias due to some numerical inaccuracy, you can simulate a box of particles that are supposed to just diffuse in the box. And you look at it after 10,000 iterations, and all the particles are on the left side of the box. And that's not good, of course. But it, it can very easily happen. So you have to be very careful that you sample uniformly, um, even in the face of numerical inaccuracy. So that, that's a, to really do that right is, 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 can be a little bit tricky. Sorry, just let me ask. Mm -hmm. It's isotropic, so there's no. Random numbers, and you scale up for the angles, and they're either from the vector or what? You basically also pick a random number to just pick a direction, so li like a, an angle in space, and, and then just. Those are spherical coordinates, I guess, because you know, they're like radius and then two angles. Yeah. Right, I mean, you could do angles or you could do x, y, z, normalize it, but one of the two, right? Yeah. yeah. Just for those two right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to make that Gaussian distribution by the M cell, how many uh, steps, hopefully to see the Gaussian, how many steps should the uh, question is, uh, what's the minimal? One. 
one. Yeah, I, right. I mean, this is sort of something that's it's not so, that has nothing to do with your simulation. It, do, it doesn't doesn't force you to, to have many particles or do many iterations. It's sort of an inter it's a property of the algorithm. So it it'll, it'll make sure that you that you get the right. And one iteration is it's. I mean, you can try to you, you add 10,000 particles to a simulation to a single step, look at their initial and final locations, and, and plot the histogram, and you should, should see that Gaussian. So you can do that as an exercise if you want. It would actually be an interesting exercise, okay. should add. All right, so I'm going to move on to um, unimolecular transitions. So basically, these would be uh, reactions of this type. So you have a reactant. Um, S0 that can undergo a number of um, transitions to states S1 and S2 with these rate constants K1 to Kn. So this is our reactions of the type A goes to B or you know, B goes to C, so unimolecular transitions. Um, and there, you know, it could have a couple of products. So it could be A goes to B plus C or A goes to D plus E. All right? so these are first order rate constants. The units are 1 over second, just to repeat the units once in a while. So basically what we need to compute to be able to do an M-cell simulation of that, we need to compute the probability in a, for, for, this, for one of these transitions to occur. So basically you can use its Monte Carlo approach to basically decide should this reaction occur or not. And the way we can compute it is the following. We can, um, we can compute the fraction of this um, product that undergoes a transition, it's, it's simply this ratio here, right? The number of um, products S1 to Sn that we have at time t over the amount of um, reactant we had at time 0. And you can simplify it this, this way. So this is, this is one piece of information we have. And then if you use mass action kinetics from the rate equation, we know that the rate of change of um, reactant is equal to um, the sum of these individual unimolecular uh, rate, first order rate constants times the concentration times dt. So, that's, so you can simplify it this way. So basically, at this point, I've just written down the information we have. There's no, no math here. So it's, it's two pieces of information we have. Okay? The probability that this undergoes a transition is given by this um, ratio. And this is what we get from just the rate equation. ds by dt is proportional to k times this um, s. All right. Again, if that's a little bit too fast, it's, uh, there's more detail in the book chapter. You can read this tonight and um, put it under your pillow and maybe absorb it that way. But it's hopefully. <laughs> and so basically, what we now do is we, we take this thing here. And, and we do uh, in, we, in, we integrate it. Right? We, so, we try to solve this equation. Um, so you you write it like this. You integrate both sides, and if you do this, you get this expression. So basically, um, the ratio of um, the concentration of product at time t over the initial concentration is given by the exponential, um, the sum of all these rate constants times, times t. So it's a simple integral here. And so what we can do now here is we can use this in here. And if you just put this in, this is the final equation we get. So basically, the probability um, for unimolecular transition is given by this. 
And the, the probabilities for these individual transitions, 1, P1 to Pn, are given by this quantity and then this, this ratio, K1 over the sum of the Ks. So this is basically how we can compute the probability that this transition will happen, or this transition will happen, or this transition will happen. And we can do that basically at simulation startup. Right? It just it, it's only depends on the Ks that you put into your MDL file and the T, which is basically the time step of your simulation. So they're easy to compute. Um, and so so, ba so in order to do um, unimolecular reaction, the, the naive way, and that's the way how we used to do it um, a while ago, is basically you, um, you compute all these probabilities and each time step you look at all the molecules you have and all the molecules that cannot, could undergo unimolecular reactions, you, you say, you have the probability and you ask, you, you use a random number and you ask, should this reaction happen or not? Yes, okay, it happens. Then you go to the next molecule, should this reaction happen or not? Yes or no, and so forth. And, and you realize that's actually a lot of work because every time step you have to ask all molecules which can undergo this reaction, you know, should you react or not? And, and many times this reaction doesn't happen because, you know, these, these, these might be reactions that only happen very rarely. So you're basically asking molecules a lot of questions, um, but nothing ever happens. So it's a, sort of an ineffective way to deal with this problem. And so the way we have solved it in mCell3 um, is that instead of, ask, instead of querying molecules every time step if reactions should happen or not, we actually give them a lifetime. So we have added a scheduler to mCell3 um, that schedules events during a simulation, and we give mole and we can mole we can give molecules a lifetime based on their um, reaction rate constant. So basically, it's an exponential distribution, and we can now we can pick from this distribution, and we can give each molecule a lifetime. And using that information, we basically don't have to look at this molecule at all anymore until it's supposed to um, disappear. So, and so this saves a lot of computational time. It's a very effective way to deal with these types of, with these unimolecular transitions. And this is basically what we do. So we have a scheduler. Um, we give molecules lifetimes. And they're scheduled to disappear somewhere in the future. And until this point in time, we don't care. We'll just leave it alone. The only reason we might care again, it might disappear for some other reason beforehand. Could be. There might be other reactions it might participate in, bimolecular reactions. But if nothing happens to the molecule for the next 10 seconds, we couldn't care less. We just, we just ignore it and just look at it in 10 seconds. So it's a very efficient way to do that, um, unimolecular transitions. Yes? So makes the exponential distribution the appropriate one to use? For, for this, because it's, a, it's, a, it's basically, oops. It's basically this thing here, right? It's sort of just, it's, it's, a, it's an exponential process. It's like, it's like radioactive decay, more or less, right? You have a probability, yeah, right. You have a probability for something to happen with a certain rate constant, so it just, it just kind of disappears exponentially. Um, yeah. Uh, way back to equation 10. 10, yep. Right. Yeah. That. So that's, that's basically how unimolecular transitions are done in M cell. You have the rate constant for it, you compute a lifetime, you put it in the scheduler, and then you deal with it as the time comes.
schedule it for the event to happen in the future, and if it's during the same time step, it gets scheduled to happen again during the same time step. So we actually return to it again in the scheduler mm -hmm. later during the same time step. And then if the, and if and if it's still short and still in the same time step, it gets scheduled again mm -hmm. and again and again. So you can actually have multiple transitions of the particle happening within a single time step, and that's how we'll track them all. Mm -hmm. Right. At the end of the time step, the state is whatever it is, but then that carries over into the, you know, and then it stays, carries over into the next time step. It might keep going, you know, a million times. So if you have things that happen very, very fast, this can make MPL spend a lot of time bumping it forward in time, but at least it's doing it correctly and perfectly. Hmm. And it's, it's not missing any transitions right. that happen, even though your time step is delta T. Cells tracking each little microscopic event correctly. Mm -hmm. And so then from the point of view of unimolecular transitions, M cell really doesn't have a time step. It's all adapted. Right. It's an adaptive time step. And where the delta T where your time step matters though, uh, when looking at unimolecular transitions, is it's the it's the time step that you said you want you wanted your simulation to run. That time step that you set is the granularity of output from M cell. So the unimolecular things are happening adaptively on no time, you know, on an infinite defined time step, or you know, double precision defined time step. But your but your simulation time step sets the granularity at which you're getting output from M cell, and that so it's a sampling thing, right? So it's a Nyquist sampling thing. Right. Yeah. It's so inescapable in nature anyway, right? In real life, these transitions might be happening that fast, but you've got some experiment, you're recording what what you know what the state is at different points in time. You have the same problem in your experiment of, of sampling at a coarser time you know, time scale than than nature. Right, so, so in, internally we will do a lot of smart things to make this efficient and work well, but sort of the, the key insight here is that using uh, lifetime you can really save yourself a lot of computation and make things very efficient. And so one of the goals for our MSL development is always trying to make things as fast as possible. Um, and so this is one of the um, crucial bits of making things faster. Um, it, you know, it could, for example, just be, let's just say you have a, you have a, a, a membrane um, protein, uh, like a channel, that undergoes a state transition, open-closed. So A would be the open state, B would be the closed state, so A goes to B would be channel opening with a certain rate. So B goes... No, but so, so so you shouldn't confuse the so if you if you say A goes to B, A and B could be the same molecule. You're talking about states here. So A would be your molecule in the closed state, B would be a molecule in the open state. So the the lifetime you would compute here would be the time at which your channel would open. Right? And so um, maybe that happens in a millisecond from now. So um, basically, the channel is closed now. You compute the lifetime for this opening process. The, um, for this particular molecule is in a millisecond. So basically, after millisecond into your simulation, this channel will open. Um, if you pick another channel, since it's an exponential distribution, it won't be a millisecond. It might be half a millisecond. But again, you sample from this exponential distribution. So things are more likely, you know, right. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so we'll go to the bimolecular associations. Um, again, if you're afraid of too many equations, um, don't, don't be too scared. Um, again, sort of our challenge here again, just like for the unimolecular reactions, is to we need to compute um, a value for the probability of this 
um, reaction A plus R going to one of these states, AR1 to ARN with rate constants K. We need to compute a value, um, a mathematical relation for this probability that we can use in our M cell simulation. So that's our task. And we, we do a very similar approach, um, or similar approach that we used for the unimolecular reactions. Basically, um, what we have, what we know about our system is that we have, let's just say we have a volume in the surface molecules that, that interact here. So A is a volume molecule, R is a surface molecule. So what happens in a simulation, you basically have this molecule A hitting that surface molecule wanting to react. And we need to know now the probability with which this is going to happen. So it, it'll, it'll, it'll do this uh, interaction repeatedly. And so basically, the probability, the average rate of binding is given by this, by this equation. So basically, this is the probability for the reaction to happen. So 1 minus this is the probability for the reaction not to happen. If it doesn't happen for NH hits, if it's still there after it has hit the molecule NH times, um, the probability for it to still is 1 minus PB to the power of NH, right? So if, it, if, it, if the reaction doesn't happen after the first encounter, the probability for that is 1 minus PB. It's still there. It tries again. It's 1 minus PB to the power of 2. It tries again. It's still there. The reaction hasn't happened. It's 1 minus PB to the power of 3. And if it tries NH time and it's still there, the probability for that to happen is 1 minus PB, PB over NH, right? So, and so the rate of binding then is 1 minus this. So if this is a little bit abstract, you probably have to write it down on a piece of paper and convince yourself that this is the expression for the average rate of binding. So what's NH? Where did that come from? It's basically just the number of encounters that, that your molecule has the number of encounters that your volume molecule has with the surface. So it'll, as things start diffusing and moving around in your simulation, it'll encounter that molecule a repeated number of times, right? During a single time step. Right. So this is NH is the right. number of encounters during a single right. time step. Right, exactly. Um, it comes from the uh, Smolakowski Einstein. Right. Um, and then another piece of information that we have is that um, we have our mass action kinetics. So we have our rate constants, K. We have our concentrations, uh, concentration of molecule A. We have our time step. And so the, the rate with which um, these guys sh should react is simply, again, given by this equation. Right? It's just using mass action kinetics using the rate constants, the concentrations of, product, uh, of reactants, and the time step. And basically, this and this, th we, is, that's an identical quantity. So we have two ways of computing this quantity. So we can set them equal and solve for the quantity we're interested in. So that's what we're doing. We'll have to make a few approximations. Basically, what the approximations we make, if the time step is small enough, um, then you can simplify this guy like so. Right? It's basically a Taylor expansion. Not, not quite, yeah. Um, and if you make this simplification, you can do the math, and you basically end up with this equation. For the probability that, that um, if, a, if molecule A strikes your molecule R, that this reaction will happen. Okay. There was a lot of math that I left out, but hopefully you um, understand that you basically use these two pieces of information, mass action kinetics and this, this relationship here um, that have to be equal, or that we actually say should be equal in an M cell simulation, and then solve for this qu quantity PB. So the only thing we're left with right now is we, we're still, we still have this quantity NH in here that we don't really know, right? So this is, we don't know how many times a particle, well, we need to compute it. We need to know how many times a, 
this particle will, will interact with the surface molecule during a time step. So we need to compute that. So that's sort of the last step we need to do. And the way we do this is we just remind ourselves how the surface looks like. The surface, as we mentioned, has, is triangulated. So this is a surface tile that contains this surface molecule A. And the number of hits, basically, we can compute like so. So we have um, part volume molecules um, that, are, that, that, that are basically in this case, on top of the surface, and the number of molecules that can interact with the surface during a given time step is basically the number of molecules in this volume that move downward toward the surface. Right? If, if, you, if your molecule in here, it can either move away or toward the surface. So this is where this factor 0.5 comes from. And the number of molecules in this volume is basically um, the concentration of molecules that we have, concentration of molecule A, times the volume of this, um, how do you call that shape? Parallel? No. Uh, parallel pipette. Parallel pipette, okay. So times the volume of this parallel Are you pipette. That the diffusion of molecules is influenced by gravity? No. It's basically, it's, it's basically, only the mole during a given time step, molecules on average move L LR bar, right? And so only molecules that are within that distance from the surface can possibly interact within a time step. So that we know. And so these are basically the molecules within that volume can interact with the surface. And only actually half of them, because half of them will move away from the surface on average, and half of them will move toward the surface. And using that information, you can actually compute the number of hits. So the number of mo molecules in this volume is um, the concentration of molecules that we have, A. And the volume of this, this guy here is the surface area of this tile. This is AET, so surface area of this tile, times this, this thing. And this is basically our. LR bar, or here it's called L, perpendicular. They're almost the same by a factor of two. So this is basically the average distance particles move along a Cartesian direction. Does it make sense? It's basically you compute the number of molecules that are in this volume. These are the guys that can interact with that tile. And the factor of 0.5 you need because half of your molecules will actually move away from the surface so they won't hit it. Yes? Yes, yeah. that's right. Right, right, right. And so, so if you use this number of hits, this is basically your NH, um, and you in integrate over time. So you can actually compute the value of NH and insert it into this equation we had here to end up with this final equation for the probability um, for these react for this interaction to take place. So th this, is mo this is basically what, what we use in M-cell to compute these probabilities. It, it only depends on the time step, diffusion coefficient, um, the surface area of your tiles, all things we know, and Avogadro's number, which we all know. And, and the Ks, of course. These are, these are the rate constants. Um, that you put into your MDL file. There's one thing here that I need to mention now, and that's basic. It's actually a crucial point. We talked about it when people asked, what's the right time step? What should you use? You can see that your probability actually depends on D and delta T and K. And so you can, you can imagine that if you choose K and D and delta T the right way, this will be greater than 1. So it's not. I just have to crank up my, my time step long enough, and at some point this will be greater than 1. And it, it obviously can't be. Right? A probability can never be greater than 1. And so, so it's basically your responsibility to, to ensure that your 
k, d, and delta t is such that your probabilities are lower than 1. This is, there are some cases where, this, where you want it to be larger than 1, but typically it, it has to be smaller than 1. Um, and, so, and so since the, the, real, the real variable in this equation really is your delta t. I mean, the k's are usually <coughs> fixed. You have them from experiment. Your d is, you know, you know that too. So basically the, the knob you have to turn here is your delta t. So basically you have to turn your delta t such that all the probabilities for reactions in your system is, are smaller than 1. If you run MCell at the beginning of your simulation, MCell will list all the probabilities for all your reactions. And so one of the first things you should do when you run an MCell simulation, a new model, look at these numbers and make sure they're all smaller than 1. Um, uh, and smaller than, by smaller than 1, it's sort of, I probably mean smaller than 0.5. Um, as, as you get closer to 1, things tend to become inaccurate, but I think if you're below 0.5 or you're usually fine, so you shouldn't be 0.99 probably. Um, and what will happen basically if, if, if the probability is greater than 1, that means that, so if your probability is 1, that means every time these particles interact, they react. Probability is 1. If your probability is 1.2, M cell can't deal with that, right? Because it the only thing it can do is they can react all the time. Every time they meet, they can react. There's no react more often than that. So as soon as you hit 1.2, you'll miss reactions. M cell just can't react faster than all the time. And so what you, what you will get at, at the end of your simulation sometimes is M cell will tell you, I missed some reactions. I, you know, 30% of your reactions were missed. If you get that message, you should check your probabilities. So that basically means the time step that you've imposed is too large for M cell to be able to sample the reaction. Um, and so, so that, that means basically that your case kind of determine, in some sense, the time step that you can impose on your simulations. If you have a very fast reaction in a system, very fast kinetics somewhere, this basically sets your time step. And, and, and so this, this is sort of, Basically, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're done with preparing your simulations and your model is, looks good, then maybe the last step would be to crank up delta T as much as you can because it obviously speeds up your simulations. And you can monitor the probabilities and, and you, look at the, you look at the one that is the largest one and just to adjust your delta T until you're, you know, 0.5 or 0.1 or something like that. And that point is as fast as you can go. OK? Um, so yeah, so again, so this is basically how we do biomolecular reactions. We have this relationship. We have all the quantities we need here at simulation startup. And so we pre compute all the probabilities. They're stored and then during a simulation, every time these two particles interact, we just um, use a random number to decide if this reaction will happen or not. There's one, um, there's one addition to that. I, th I don't think we have talked about it. Do we have tutorials that have variable reaction rates? OK, so, so M cell actually allows you to have variable reaction rates, so you, you can um, can have a time-dependent um, reaction rate instead of just a fixed one. The way you do this is you supply a text file that has a list of reaction rates and times when these should be turned on. So you can ac actually have a very complex um, shape for your reaction rates. And in this case, these PBs would be recomputed during runtime because if your K changes, your probabilities change too. And, and this really allows you to have very um, complex reactions, for example, you can model the opening of channels um, triggered by an action potential that's time dependent. So the rates would change as the action potential invades the terminal. Um, okay. The no, these are reaction rate constants, so they're not, they're actually not dependent on the concentration. Yeah, you, you said reaction rate, 
Yes. Sorry, I'm a little bit sloppy here. So. But the rate of reaction does. The rate Absolutely. Of reaction does change with concentration, <laughs> but they're just handled automatically right. by the simulation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because the probability of binding mm -hmm. uh, PV, that's the probability of binding per collision. Right. And at higher concentration, there's more collisions. Right. So. Um, so Correct. Yeah, so if I say reaction rates, I really mean reaction rate constants. I apologize for being sloppy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so I should. So this is sort of the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and this is um, how we do reactions in the volume. That's a little bit different from what I told you for reactions between a volume molecule and a surface molecule. <clears throat> so basically what happens, we have a molecule A and molecules B and C, and let's say we have a reaction that's defined like so, A plus B goes to some product state. Um, so now A um, is a diffusing volume molecule, and it'll actually diffuse, take a random walk step according to this Gaussian distribution that we had talked about in the beginning. So, and it, it'll take a, it'll take a step from its initial position <coughs> to its final position. And what happens as it, and so this, this random, so this movement will actually happen via ray tracing. So it'll actually move physically through space, um, tracing out a reaction cylinder. So for the purpose of discovering reactions, we imbue molecules with a um, dimension, if you wish, sort of a reaction, um, uh, collision detection. And, and so ba as this molecule moves from, from initial to final location, it sweeps out the cylinder. So this is some, sometimes a little bit confusing to people. So this is not meant to be the size of the molecule. It has nothing to do with the size. The molecules are point particles. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a mathematical or numerical way for us to detect collisions as A moves through space from its initial to final position. So, so we give it a radius that will detect um, po potential reaction partners as it goes along. So basically, it sweeps out the cylinder. It's possible that on its way to its final location, it actually hit a wall, so it'll reflect specularly. And so if there's a wall here, it'll go here, 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 here. And it'll sweep out this cylinder. And it'll check for reaction partners within the cylinder. So as A, in this case, as A goes from here to here, it'll, um, it, it'll start going. And at this point, it'll detect um, that there's a molecule B. It'll check, is the reaction, um, do I have a reaction defined with B? If yes, it'll test if this reaction happens. If it happens, then the products will be created. Maybe it'll disappear. If this reaction doesn't happen, it'll continue. Um, it, it won't discover this B because it's outside this, the cylinder. Until here, there's another B, and it'll do another test if, the, if this reaction happens, and so forth. So this is basically how we discover reactions um, during the diffusion process. So it's a little bit different from how other Monte Carlo algorithms do their movement step. So, so I think programs like Smolden, for example, they will just move the particle from the initial to the final location. And then they will discover reaction partners around the final location. So move and then discovery. We, in, in MCEL, actually, we discover reactions as we go along. So we'll first discover reactions that are close by in space, and then the ones that are further away in space. And so you have a little bit more accurate sampling if you're, if you're if your concentration is uniform, it doesn't matter. Right? If, you, if you have uniform concentration of B, it shouldn't matter if you do it as you go or if you do it once you're done, because it's uniform. However, if you have, an, if you have a situation where, the concent where it's not well mixed, let's just say there's a lot of B where A starts and there's no B where it ends up, then it makes a difference, because you actually sample uh, the spatial the spatial regions where you have this high concentration where it starts off um, 
you actually detect these reactions with B, whereas <coughs> there's nothing to react with at the final location. So you have a little bit better spatial sampling as you move to your final location. If, yes? If B is also going this time step undergoing movement, do these, have to, do these two cylinder paths have to cross? Uh, They're basically done one at a time and picked randomly. So it, 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 you know, in this case, A starts and this reaction happens. It could be that you know, if, you, if you run a different seed, B is the one that goes first and detects the reaction with A first. Okay. So within a time step, there's, no, there's basically no temporal granularity. It shouldn't matter if B goes first or A goes first. So this is basically, so this is, this is not like an MD simulation where you, actually, where you actually have, where you're solving some dynamical equation and there's a real time evolution of some Hamiltonian. Basically what happens within a time step is more or less unresolved. It, it happens and the order shouldn't matter. And that is actually your, for us as developers, we have to ensure that it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the order of things shouldn't matter. Right. And so, uh, I said it's just all the particles is just point. Mm -hmm. So how, how MCL do with collision? Is it, it has the same coordinate, exactly the same coordinate? Basically, you, you have, that's, so in order to do this detection while we go, we have to, we basically give it an interaction radius. So it, it, it acquires a dimension while it moves. But it's not the physical dimension um, of, of the particle. It's basically a way for us to compute the probabilities. Basically, um, if, let's just say the probability for this reaction to occur is 0.5 for this interaction radius. Um, if you would increase the interaction radius, so, so it, it'll actually sweep out a larger volume, then these probabilities would become smaller, right? Because on average, it would detect more B molecules in this volume. So basically, the math, the math is correct. So the, the, the probabilities scale with the size of this volume. So my question is, is uh, mm -hmm. once when you trace the MCL simulation, and what, in one point, to trace, we need to trace two, two trajectories, and they have uh, some sort of, bef uh, it, it, it the, at the moment of reaction, have a, some sort of collapse and have overlap. That's why after, after that have produced the C molecule. And at that time, is there is a two trajectories that's the same, or, or is there has a, some sort of minimal boundaries? It has no volume, so I'll, yeah, I was curious as uh, how to deal with the collision thing. I'm not, I'm not the products of the, react, of the reaction are placed in space, they could mm -hmm. be infinitesimally close to each other. Right. The products. Uh -huh. So what's the smallest? Uh, They're points. Yeah. They're points. Yeah, so. Right. So they can be infinitesimally close to each other mm -hmm. after the reaction occurs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. but this is the how, how close is, but this is really in, the smallest part is, is how the MCL deal with this, this guy, this, this collision. Uh, I'm not completely sure. Uh, Maybe we can talk about it yeah. offline. So it's, uh, yeah, so, so you shouldn't imagine this as a real trajectory that a particle would actually, um, I mean, you know, the real trajectory of this particle is not a straight line. It's like, as, as, as it, 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 it goes like in, yeah, right. If you go down to the femtosecond time scale, right? Right. The it, MD. If you go down to the MD time scale, it's not random. It's deterministic. Mm -hmm. F equals ma. Right. It's all Newtonian, right? And the motion is coming from the collisions it has with the water particles hitting it. As you know, yeah. at the beginning of the discussion today, you know, Marcus yeah. showed that, right? Um, there, the, the things do have volume and. and, and yeah. And hitting each other, right? And you have all these microscopic collisions that are happening on the femtosecond time scale. But as we go to longer and longer time scale, at a certain point, um, statistically, right, you can't, uh, at, after so many collisions have occurred, these Newtonian yeah. F equals MA collisions have occurred, you can look at the initial position at time zero and now some time C later, Statistically, it, you, can, you, can, you can ask, you know, what's the distribution of, of, 
position that the particles end up after some time t um, that you've been tracking using mv, mm -hmm. right? And at a certain point, it becomes a Gaussian distribution. The answer to that, you know, to, to the question, what's the distribution of positions that end up mm -hmm. that they end up in, in after time t? Mm -hmm. It's it looks Gaussian at that point then you can treat it as a random process. It turns out that that happens after about 300 femtoseconds. Okay, so after, and there are many, many tens of thousands of collisions, I don't know how many yeah. tens of thousands of collisions that occurred between your particle, your, your solute particle in the water solvent. There's many, many tens of thousands of F equals MA collisions that have been happening. But after those tens of thousands, now the the, the end you know the end position the particle mm -hmm. ends up with is this Gaussian, right. and it looks random. It's not random, right? But it looks random, and so why track all those tens of thousands of collisions, right? You can now use a longer uh, time step. It's longer delta t, but instead of doing f equals ma on it, you just use this Gaussian random number generation random walk. Right. To do it. But at that point, you've lost track of all this tortuous path that the particle has traveled. It, it, it's now at point A and it ends up at point B. And, and, and the longer you make delta T, the, the, the farther the displacement gets. But that displacement drops off as the square root of time. Right. Right? That makes diffusion look slower and slower and slower. But its real path is the integrate, you know, is this integral along that whole path. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so the, the, the key is basically that we, the only thing that we really compute here is that if, it's, if it starts off here, we, we pick a random direction and some displacement, we know it ends up here. The path between those two, we don't know. And so the way we do it, the way we do it in Amstel is we do a ray tray. We, we throw a ray from here to here and just go linearly along this path. But it's an approximation. It's not how the particle goes, but it's it's one way to move from here to here and discover reactions along the way. It's by no means the right way or the only way, but it's the way that Amstel does it. So it's it's. And the critical thing is to get the right time evolution. Exactly. Of where it is. So, so what, and to detect the right number of collisions right. that have occurred, because the number, of, remember, it's the it's the, the number of collisions n sub h that we use to calculate right. the probability of reaction per collision. Right. So if we if we don't miss any collisions, and if we calculate n sub h correctly, and if we calculate its displacement as a function of time correctly, then we'll get the right time evolution and reaction evolution of the, of the thing in space and time. I mean, the key is that we reproduce mass action kinetics in the end. I mean, that's, so whatever, whatever algorithm you come up with, and you can come up with many others probably that are more complicated, you want to reproduce math ac mass action kinetics. So an another way to look at this cylinder sweeping out in time is, now let's do a chain coordinate system. Pretend that A sub i is not moving. And it has a and it has a disc disc shape, and it's the particles of B, uh, the two particles of B and the particle of C that are moving along that ray toward A. Right? Then it looks exactly like the diagram mm -hmm. Marcus showed earlier of the particles diffusing and hitting a surface pile. It's really the same thing in a change of coordinate system, but right. now instead of the particles moving hitting the surface. The surface is moving. The disk is sweeping through space and hitting the right. particle. Yeah, so you can it's really the same thing. It's just a change of coordinates. So you can basically use the same kind of math that I just showed you to actually also compute the probabilities here. So, I, um, so I'm actually going to stop here, I think. So there's lots more math I could go through. But um, everything's in that book chapter, so we'll post it online. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to Tom or me um, about the if you need more details. So I hope this at least showed you that the foundations of what's really go going on in MCEL. So it's, it's, it's 
actually fairly straightforward. The implementation in terms of a, an efficient computational code is a different matter, but sort of I think the math that underlies you know, the probabilities that we use for computing unimolecular, bimolecular reactions, um, these volume reactions, and also mm -hmm. for the diffusion really come from mass action kinetics and diffusion theory. And so this is really sort of the base level, the foundation of MCEL. So I suggest we'll make maybe a 10-minute break, and then Jim can um, continue with uh, Rule, Bender, Biogen. OK, thanks.